Um, this is going to be a very short talk. It's basically going to be me dragging a highlighter over certain parts of what Juan just said. <laughs> uh, Ethereum on IPFS. So yeah, we, got, we kind of dug around inside the internals of IPFS and IPLD and how all that works. And so how can we take an application that wasn't built to work on IPFS and, and sort of map it onto IPFS and see that that actually works pretty well. Um, so yeah, Ethereum loves IPFS. We were hoping to have these stickers for you, but they never showed up. Um, so what, what's a blockchain? It's, it's a combination of a couple things. One, you have a peer-to-peer -peer network. You have a consensus algorithm. You have some historical log, and you have, which, is, which in aggregate gives you the, the, uh, the current state. And both the historical log and the current state, they're, they're hash-linked data. Um, so you've seen some graphs already. It looks a bit like this. Uh, so IPFS is a peer-to-peer -peer network that serves hash-linked data. And so IPFS or Ethereum on IPFS is a peer-to-peer -peer network where you get your hash-linked data for the state and the history. And then you just layer your consensus algorithm on top uh, for you to resolve uh, what's the current head, where it's the current state. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly on IPLD resolvers. And then you're going to get more of a deep dive in the next talk. Um, so this is my possibly fictitious history of IPFS and, and looking up data on IPFS. Uh, first, you look it up by a, by a hash, and you get data. And they're like, well, it makes more sense to be able to use any kind of hash to look up your data, and then using any kind of hash to look up any kind of data format. Um, so then the resolvers, w when we specify the format, we can uh, use these resolvers to look inside that data. We're getting some binary data blob, and you can, you can pull out some specific information, or you can pick out a link to, to something else. Um, and we can use human-readable names. Um, so if you have your, your identifier for your Ethereum block, you could grab the, the number of that block, or the, the miner, the validator that created that block. Um, and, and then you can keep going. You can say, like, I want to look at inside the state, the sort of snapshot of the state at that block. And I want to look inside an address, and I want to get the balance of the user at that. Um, and, uh, or you could look inside, if it's a smart contract at that address, you can dig into that smart contract and get um, some, some value inside its storage at some key. Um, and so while we had to build an Ethereum-specific IPLD resolver, um, when, you, when you look up that data, it will auto-generate a, a Merkle proof that that value is correct um, with, and without the system having to really understand any semantics of Ethereum, that this is a smart contract and it has storage and all that stuff. Uh, we just use the IPLD to, to walk you through that, those data blobs to other data blobs. Um, so so that was, that was uh, you know, reading static data uh, about the blockchain, but that's, there's you know, a lot more going on. How do you take actions in the network? Um, so libp2p is part of the, the networking stack used by IPFS. And they have a feature um, somewhere between development and production uh, called global PubSub. And it lets you basically globally subscribe um, to topics on the network or publish on those topics. Um, so utilizing that, you as a, as a client, you could uh, just subscribe to incoming blocks. And every time there's a, the network new, knows about a new block, you get that new block. And then you can sign your transactions and publish on that topic. But there's a new signed transaction. As a, as a validator, as a miner, uh, you'd, you'd want to, of course, you'd want to also know about new, uh, new blocks. Um, but you'd also want to listen for those new signed transactions that you'd want to put inside your block, the block that you're mining. And then you can publish the blocks that you've mined on that topic. Um, and then we can start experimenting with other things. You didn't talk about IPNS too much, but um, you can, you know, IPFS is all mutable or immutable links, right? So they're all, they're all static. I, IPNS lets you uh, basically publish an updated value at, at, some, at some name. And that updated value or that mutable value is just pointing to another immutable reference. And then you could walk, you know, walk down there as you need. Um, so you could say what your, as, as a peer on the network, you could say what your 
um, view into the, the, what the latest block is. You could just publish that on your identity. And others could, if you, for example, had a very resource constrained device that you owned, you could tell it to just follow uh, whatever you had published as the latest. Or whatever the Ethereum Foundation had published, or you know, N of M good actors. And then you have a very lightweight consensus sitting on top of the like strong heavyweight consensus of a blockchain. Uh, but I mean, like Ethereum already works, so so why would you bother building all this? Um, uh, so one is is I, you know IPFS and and uh, libpdp. It's it's more general, so I think you're going to have uh, more people coming out of the woodwork to to, to contribute um, new new pieces of technology that maybe use Ethereum consensus here and use maybe state channels or. Uh, to be part of that peer-to-peer -peer network is it's a much more open invitation, I feel, whereas um, messing with Ethereum protocols, you might uh, get the cold shoulder a little bit. Uh, hopefully that's not true. Um, but anyways, I, I find it to be open by definition, and so I think that will encourage lots of people to play with it. Um, but not only that, um, we need it at MetaMask. Currently, by default, when you use MetaMask, you get, you know, you can interact with Ethereum in, in your web browser. And uh, Frankie's going to talk about that later. Um, but you can see, it's like, uh, hopefully not bugging out right now. So it's up here in the corner. And I can use that to, to interact with, with Ethereum. Uh, but the way we make that work without you sitting there syncing for uh, minutes or hours or whatever it might be um, is, by default, we rely on a trusted data source. And, um, and so you still have, you still have Trust agility. At any point, you can say, "No, I want to. I want to get that data from my own node, or, or I'm going to spin something up in the cloud, or I'd rather move to this other data provider." You can do that at any any time. So, um, yeah, so if we were to become bad actors suddenly, you could you could move off of that very easily. So that that's quite valuable, um, but it's still so we have a poor default. And so our hands are tied a little bit because we have no TCP UDP in the browser to talk to the main Ethereum network. Um, so what are we going to do? Perhaps we'll build a second network on WebRTC uh, via libp2p and, and using some bridge nodes to help make the data accessible and get transactions to the miners. Uh, thanks.